Well, hey, good morning. We are bringing another Sunday to your sofa and we thought it would only be right if we welcome you this morning from our sofa. sofa. So we are thankful for you joining us, whether this is your first time or whether you've been with us on this journey. We're so glad and excited that you are checking in with us today. Naomi's just going to run through what our service plan looks like for you. So we're um, welcoming you firstly, and then uh, we're going to head over to um, Lucy, who's going to lead us in a time of worship. And then um, Johnny's going to bring the word, um, a message that I think is a really valuable and important word for us all to be hearing at the moment um, on unexpected people. And then uh, we're going to have a time of communion together. So uh, can I just encourage you to take a moment where you can go and grab your Bible or switch your Bible on. Um, just be ready and willing to hear for what the Lord is wanting to say to you this morning. Johnny, do you want to pray for us? Yeah, thank you. Let's pray together, shall we? Father God, we want to thank you that we can gather together online again this morning. We want to thank you, Lord God, that we can join together in our different homes, wherever we are, whoever we are, Lord God, we want to thank you that we can still be a part of the body of Christ. Lord God, I pray that we will know more about you as a result of today's service and the teaching that we will hear. Lord God, I pray that we'll have ears to listen, hearts open and ready to receive what it is that you want to do with us this morning. Mm. Lord God, I pray that you are still our hearts and quiet in our mind, Lord God, so that we can really understand and hear for ourselves what it is that you would say to us today. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. So we are going to head over to Lucy. Trample 
took the fall and thought of me above all. Like a rose trampled on the ground, you took the Well, hey, welcome, good morning. We are in week two of Unexpected People, and if you didn't get a chance to tune in last week, then you can check out our website, ifordbaptistchurch.co.uk, and you can catch up with all of our latest sermons right there, or you can head directly to YouTube, and you can search Ifford Baptist Church, and you will see Unexpected People Part 1 right there as well. But if you are joining us for the first time or you have been on this journey with us since this lockdown period began, then we just want to welcome you this morning. We are so glad that you are joining us in our online gatherings and we hope that they're helpful. We're doing what we can and we will continue to do what we can during this period. Last week, if you joined in with our Sunday gathering, then you will have noticed that we looked at this topic of unexpected people. How the very nature of the whole counsel of God is to interact, protect and welcome the unexpected people. It is our duty as Christians not to segregate. Rather, it is our responsibility to point people to the security that we can find in Jesus. We expect those who haven't found a relationship with Jesus yet to adhere to a conduct that they haven't actually heard about before. And therefore, in my preparation for this week, I felt that it was so important to carry on this conversation about the unexpected people. We explored, didn't we, that it is clear from the Old Testament and New Testament perspectives that God really cares about people. He really cares about you and I and all types of different people. That it was the mission of Jesus to be inclusive. We explored a particular part in Numbers and Deuteronomy, and we looked at how an interaction was shared between God and Moses about a conduct for both the one who is known and the unknown. For the Israelites, but also for the sojourner, the foreigner, the unexpected people who resided amongst them. We summed up the morning with two key points. Firstly, we have a responsibility to the unexpected people. To care for them, to love them, to reach them, to go against the grain and encourage them. To behave like Jesus would behave towards them. And secondly, in reality we are all unexpected people. None of us deserve the grace of God, yet when we accept and discover for ourselves who Jesus is and the promise that he has for our lives then it doesn't matter who we were or the background that we once had, which maybe doesn't do any favours for our character. What matters is about who we are committing to being and becoming. When Jesus was sharing his story one day with his disciples, the question was asked by the scribes and the Pharisees, basically the ones who were trying to catch Jesus out, and they asked him this question. What is the greatest commandment of the law. If you've got your Bibles out in front of you, then let's look at this passage together. We're going to head to Matthew 22, 34 to 40. I'm going to give you a few moments just to get there. It says this, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Essentially, what is the greatest commandment in the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible? And Jesus responds in verse 37 by saying these words. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul 
and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and all of the prophets hang on these two commandments. If we head back to a different interaction between Moses and God, when Moses was being instructed of the commandments and patterns of life that the people of God should be endeavouring to follow, we see in Deuteronomy 6 this call for a wholehearted commitment. Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 6 says this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. And this covers our expectation for the first half of this great command for the Israelites as the unexpected people. It sets a conduct of how they were supposed to live. If we jump back even a little bit further into the Old Testament, we see in Leviticus 19, 9 to 18, a phrase which is repeated at the end of every paragraph. I am the Lord your God. It is here where God addresses the respect and love that the ones who we are aware of, who know who God is, how we should treat those who don't. It appears to our nature, the ones of us who know who God is and explains to us how we should treat those who don't yet know him. Specifically in verse 18, it says this, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among you, but love your neighbour as yourself. I am the Lord your God. You see, there is a code of conduct right from the beginning of God's people forming, right the way through the whole word of God and right until today. Our conduct drives our character and our character drives our conduct. That is an inexcusable truth. From what we've looked at so far this morning in both the Old and the New Testament, in Matthew and in Deuteronomy and in Leviticus, there are three clear themes that are, ide- that are identified in these scriptures. Love God, love others, love yourself. Three of what some could argue are simple priorities. Love God, love others, love yourself. How many of us have that whole rally wrapped up? I'm not sure I do, if we're honest. There are certainly times where I haven't loved myself or others. And there are certainly times where I've questioned God's love for me. I think what it's really important to highlight here is that these aren't three things that you're going to get a gold badge for doing. They're not even necessarily something that you're always going to feel like doing. They may, even on Sundays, feel completely impossible to do. That isn't what this is about. Rather, it is a code, it is an expectation which we can endeavour to lean towards. When we live by a code of conduct which should shape our character, here's what it says about us. We're committed wholeheartedly to the call of who we are in God. We are committed wholeheartedly to the call of the unexpected person. We're committed wholeheartedly to the call of knowing that we are loved, saved, adopted, precious, planned people in the kingdom of God for a purpose that we are continuously figuring out. We are committed wholeheartedly to recognise that before we knew We were a child of God. We lived as unexpected people in unexpected places with plenty of problems. 
But now, now we can know for ourselves that when we accept Jesus for ourselves, that the old was something that we were once a part of. And that we now have an opportunity to step into something new, something that we are now a part of. Were and are. We were part of an old something, but we are now part of a new thing that God is doing. We're reminded by Paul in the book of Colossians that we have to take off the old self because the old self is no longer fit for purpose. Let's look at that scripture right now. Colossians 3. We're going to read the whole of Colossians 3, so get there in your Bibles, follow along with me. I'm going to give you a few moments just now. Colossians 3, it says this, verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have now put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek nor Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. So put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all of these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in words or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now it's a long portion of scripture, I'm fully aware of that, but the message for me within it is pretty clear. Who you once were is not something that can be taken into who or what God wants you to become. If then you have been raised with Christ, set your minds on the things that are above which I think translates for us today. When the things that are in front of you are just too much and you can't seem to find a way forward, look up, because where does your help come from? It comes from the Lord. Take your eyes off the earthly perspective that has consumed your vision and begin to envision what would come 
when you set your eyes on what and how and who Christ has got in mind for you to be. The old self, the unexpected nature which has infiltrated your character does not have a hold over you anymore. Once you identify as a Christian, no longer unexpected yet accepted, you learn to adjust and begin to surround yourself with people who will encourage you to put on the qualities that are considered in line with the Father heart of God. I'm not going to take this scripture in any more detail today because next week we'll be taking time to unpack Colossians 3. Looking in light of these two week teaching slots on unexpected people and exploring what it now means to live as the people of God. But today the heart of what needs to be conveyed is this. What can we expect of ourselves as unexpected yet accepted people? Love God, love others and love yourselves. Now, what can we not expect? We cannot expect unexpected people to love God if they haven't ever been told about him. Love others if that's something that they've never had to do before. Love themselves if they don't see what they're really worth. We have a responsibility as a core group of people, regardless of our context, our cultural backgrounds, or our current situation, to journey with people on this discovery of finding out about what it means to have a relationship with God. Love requires action. It is something that must be expressed. Let's draw our attention to action through the scriptures that we've explored today. So loving God, right at the beginning we explored Deuteronomy and in 6 verse 5 it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul and with all your strength. Basically the entirety of our being and our living is, or at least should be, endeavouring to be a response of love back to the greatest act of love which was shown to us through the sacrifice of Jesus. Loving God and loving others. Jesus later repeats a statement similar to the one found in Deuteronomy and adds to it that you should also love your neighbour as yourself. There's something important here that I think often people miss. You cannot give away something that you do not have within you. How can someone love another person if they haven't experienced love themselves? How can someone love another person if they don't love themselves? Which leads us on to the final point, loving ourselves. We need to accept ourselves, our personalities and imperfections, knowing that although we are not where we need to be, we are making progress. God wants us to accept ourselves. And we can, as Paul reminds us, set ourselves on something I take our perspective to something deeper by looking up. That's where true acceptance and love is rooted. It isn't found in imperfect people or imperfect positions. Rather, it is rooted in a perfect God. So the message today and our call to action is rather simple. Love God, love others and love yourself. Our conduct should be in line with the action that we desire to express. And our expressed action should be one of love. Our lives as Christians will always be inexcusably linked to God, others and ourselves. And therefore how we decide to be when we know we're accepted. And then how we treat the unexpected will all be or should be rooted in the way that we see God and how his love 
have co has covered us enough for us to be able to fulfil all that he has called us to. Loving God, loving others, loving yourself. As a response to today's message, I'd love it if we could take communion together. I think this topic of unexpected people highlights something quite personal for each of us. We were once unexpected people, but as a result of the sacrifice of Jesus and the acceptance and forgiveness that we receive from him, as a result of us recognising and repenting for the former life that we were a part of, we can now come to the Lord's table, accepted, not rejected, included, not excluded. And I'd love to do a more liturgical invitation to the table for you this morning. But before we get there, if you haven't yet got yourselves sorted for communion, then may I give you a few moments just ahead to find either some ribena and bread or something that you have in your house that represents communion for you. And then myself and Naomi, my fiance, are going to lead you into the Lord's table together. All right, so here's your few moments. So I hope that you've managed to find something ready for us to take communion together. I'm going to read an invitation to the table and then Naomi's going to lead us in prayer and then lead us through 1 Corinthians 11 verse 23. Come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because any goodness of your own gives you the right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and you'd like to love him even more. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. Mm. Naomi. Let's just pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from those whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm now going to um, lead us through communion. Uh, I'm going to read the passage from 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, as Johnny's already said. So feel free to read it as we go. Um, and we're going to take communion throughout. So 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Maybe take this moment to uh, take the bread. Remember what it is that Jesus has done for each one of us. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. 
For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Let's just take a moment to pray and just reflect on this amazing gift that we have and that we are able to do in taking communion. Great. Father God, we want to thank you for the fact that you sent your son, the greatest sacrifice of all, Lord God, so that we may have an encounter with you. Yeah. Lord God, we thank you that we were unexpected, yet accepted through the sacrifice of Jesus. And Father, I want to thank you that we can gather together today in our own homes, as a church, as a body of Christ, Lord God, and remember the sacrifice that you gave us. Father, I pray that we won't just continue to consider communion as part of a service, but that we will continue to see it as a covenant relationship mm -hmm. between us and you. Father, we pray that if there is anything within us that has stopped us from receiving you for ourselves, Lord God, I pray that we will come to your throne this morning, your throne room to find you, Lord God, to repent and ask for forgiveness before you. Lord God, I pray that as we continue in the rest of our service together, that we will remember you and have you at the forefront of our minds. Yeah. We ask this in your name. Amen. 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 So the three key points for you to remember today. Love God, love others and love yourself. It has been so great to join in communion with you. It's also been great to share the message of unexpected people part two with you as well. Next week we're going to be exploring what it means to be the people of God in light of what we've learned over these last two weeks. So come expectant and ready for that. We've also got our short thought on Wednesday, the thought of the week, which goes out online. So if you haven't been checking those out, then may I encourage you to do so. We love to know that you're watching. But that's it from me. I've been Johnny. You've been great. And she has been Naomi. And I've been great. Have a great week. <laughs>